Okay, so let's wrap up talking about um, what we know neuroscientifically about how we understand other minds. This is referred to, for those of you who have um, taken things like developmental psychology with Professor Palmquist, for example, as theory of mind. Um, theory of mind is just this idea of when we are developing a theory of what another person's mind is like that is different from our own, okay? And so what are situations where we do and do not use theory of mind? Honestly, it's really, really hard to think about situations where you don't use theory of mind when you're thinking about or engaging with another person, okay? We use theory of mind when we're having a conversation with someone. You're trying to understand, are they finding what I'm saying interesting? Are they finding what I'm saying boring? Do they not want to talk about this? Am I getting too personal? Maybe I should lighten up a little bit. When you're at an interview, you're trying to determine, am I impressing this person? Did I just put my foot in my mouth? When you're meeting new people, when you're working on a class project, when you're flirting with someone you like, when you're trying to get out of a conversation with someone you don't like, you're trying to figure out how can I get out of here, but how can I do it in a way that's not overtly rude? Um, when you're playing sports, you're having you're trying to kind of understand of like, okay, what can they see? What are they going to do in response to what they see? Then what can I do? How can I engage with them? Okay, so theory of mind is an extremely pervasive human faculty. Um, and so a question is then, well, how do we study theory of mind experimentally? And there's a lot of different ways we can do it. Um, but I think probably the most famous is this thing that is called the false belief task or the Sally Ann task. Um, this might be a reminder for some of you, and, but for those of you who don't know it, the way it goes is something like this. Um, there are these little cartoon stories. So for example, um, this is Sally, um, and this is Sally's basket, and this is Anne, and this is Anne's box. So Sally puts her marbles into the basket, okay? So Sally put her marbles in her own basket. And then Sally goes out of the room and leaves Anne all alone. Um, while Sally is uh, out of the room, Anne takes the marbles out of the basket, and they, she puts them into the box. When Sally comes back, where will Sally look for her marbles, okay? Most people are going to hopefully say, Shahali's going to look in the basket because the last time she was here, she put it in the basket. We know that actually the marbles are in the box, but we know that Sally doesn't know that, okay? So that's an example of theory of mind, where we know something that Sally doesn't, okay? Now, this is a long story. It's kind of difficult to do in the scanner. So what exactly are the stimuli or the experiments that people do to study theory of mind? Um, in those cases, they come up with these little false belief scenarios. So here's an example. Um, you're in the scanner and you read a story like this. The girls left their ice cream in the freezer before they went to bed. Overnight, the power went out and the ice cream melted. And then you show up on the screen to the person. When they get up, the girls believe the ice cream is melted or frozen. And if you're a participant, you have to press one button to say melted or one button to say frozen. So in this case, we'd say frozen. Here's another false belief story. Susie parked her sports car in the driveway. In the middle of the night, Nathan moved um, her car into the garage to make room for his minivan. Susie woke up early in the morning. She expects in the driveway to see a sports car or a minivan. She expects to see a sports car, even though the answer is minivan. Okay, so these are false belief stories. There are also these things that are referred to as false photograph stories. And here's some examples of those. A volcano erupted on this small island three months ago. Barren lava rock is all that remains. Satellite photos, however, show the island as it was before the, re the eruption. In this photo, the island is covered in vegetation or rock. In this case, we would say vegetation, okay? So again, there's something that has changed. This matches the false belief scenarios in a lot of way, except there wasn't an agent involved in this. There was no person involved. Um, yes, there were these photographs. Yes, there's like, you know, a disconnect between what the photographs show and what's really going on, but it's not because of like an agent with a mind that's making these decisions. Um, here's one more false photograph example. The biography describes the bedroom as it was in 1965 when the walls were covered in dark wallpaper. In 1970, the paper was stripped and replaced with cream paint. The biography says that the room was light or dark, okay? So in this case, you would say that the biography says the room is dark, even though that it actually is light. So now in this situation, this is the contrast you would do. It's not faces versus objects. It's not in-group versus out-group. It's not moving stimuli versus static stimuli, whatever. It's false belief stories versus false photograph stories, okay? And when you do that contrast, there are basically four regions that are known to light up. Um, the precuneus, which is PC, MPFC, which stands for medial prefrontal cortex, and then these two regions, the right temporal um, parietal junction and the left temporal parietal junction. And by temporal parietal junction, it's literally like the junction right where the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe meet, okay? You can get a sense of like it's back here in between the temporal and the parietal lobe. And so what you can do, is you can look at the activation in these different brain regions. So percentage change in the bold response, because remember the bold response is the neural activity um, measurement in these brain regions. 
in all four of these brain regions when a person is doing the false belief system situation or the false photo situation. And the data in these situations looks something like this. The RTPJ, you can see it's higher for the false belief than false photo. This is also true in the left TPJ. This is also true in the precuneus. And this is also true in the MPFC, although the MPFC is kind of weird because they're both going negative. Don't worry too much about them both going negative. It just means there's an interesting weird baseline shift. Just note that the black line in all four of these cases is higher than the gray line, okay? Now, the problem though with this study as the data I've shown you thus far is what exactly can we conclude, okay? So I've shown someone false belief studies and I've shown someone false photo studies. This is one of these great examples where I really wish we could be in class together because if we were in class together like normal, at this point in the lecture, I would, take, I would take a break and I would make you talk to your partners and I would make you think about what exactly can we conclude? Um, and when I've done this before, people usually are able to figure out pretty quickly like, wait, it's kind of hard to know what you can conclude because there's a pretty big confound, okay? Sure, the false belief situations have, you know, these minds at work and the false photographs don't, but there's another more basic thing that differentiates false belief and false photo stories, which is people versus no people. There are people involved in the false belief story and there are no people involved in the false, false photo story. So is it really about other people's thoughts and beliefs? Maybe it's not really that sort of thing at all. Maybe it's just about people versus no people. So then the experimenters were like, okay, that's a fair point. Let's dig a little deeper. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try to come up with some stories that do involve people, but that don't involve their thoughts, their beliefs, and their mind, okay? So there's gonna be three situations and three different ways you can do this. One are the, the thought condition. This is the situation where we're gonna look at people's thoughts. So here are two little cases. Nikki knew that his sister's flight from San Fran was delayed 10 hours. Only one flight was delayed so much that night. So when he got to the airport, he knew that the flight was hers, okay? Rob tied his dog's leash to a lamppost while he went to the store to buy coffee. When he came out, his dog had, had run across the street. He guessed that the leash had come untied. So in all these stories, there's some sort of inferential part where you're having to learn about what another person is thinking about. So it's not exactly a false belief because in these cases, they're pretty much true beliefs, but at least you can get a sense of what's going on in Nikki's mind, what's going on in Rob's mind and so forth, okay? Now, these can be contrasted to stories that involve people but are not about their thoughts, but are about things, for example, like their bodily sensations. Sheila skipped breakfast because she was late for the train to her mother's. By the time she got off the train, she was starving. Her stomach was rumbling and she could smell food everywhere. And then the second one is Marcus had been sick for three days. He um, had felt weak and had a high fever. On the fourth day, his fever broke and he woke up feeling cool and alert. So in this case, we're learning about their body. I mean, it sort of has a sense of their thoughts because you can presume that they're thinking about how they're hungry or how they're thinking about how they're cold and so on and so forth. But we're not exactly learning about the inner workings of their mind in the same way in the blue condition over here as we are in this purplish condition there. And then the last one is about people, again, but it's this case more about their appearance. Joe was a heavy set man with a gut that fell over his belt. He was balding and combed his blonde hair over the top of his head. His face was pleasant with, with large brown eyes. Or Maria had olive skin and long black hair, which she always wore in a braid. She was tall and thin with long legs. She, was, she always wore sandals, which revealed neat red painted toenails. Okay? Again, all have um, information about people in them. Only some of them have to do with people's minds. The other are less so. They're dealing with things like the thoughts, bodily sensations, or the appearances. So once again, we're gonna look in all four of these brain regions. Again, we're looking at the activity. Um, and what we can see is in a region like the RTPJ, it's much more activated by the thoughts condition than by the bodily sensations or appearance condition. Um, this is again true in LTPJ, um, and this is also true in the precuneus. I do wanna point out, notice that there is a little bit of separation um, because as I pointed out, the bodily sensations, you can kind of have a little bit of mental inference there. You probably understand that if someone hasn't eaten and they're starving, they're maybe kind of grumpy, they're maybe in a bad mood. So you actually can see that the bodily sensations are indeed a little bit higher than the appearance, but not quite as high as when you hear explicitly stuff about um, their thought process altogether. The MPFC, however, okay, this frontal lobe region is doing a different pattern of responses because you can see that actually the red line is not really higher um, than the blue or the, I guess it's like turquoise, cyan lines, okay? So it actually seems as if already we've kind of bifurcated these different brain regions into doing somewhat different things. So before we were talking about them as if, you know, four homogenous regions are doing all the same thing. Well, now one of these things is not like the other. The MPFC doesn't seem to be responding to the, L and the, to the thoughts in the same way that LTPJ, RTPJ, and precuneus are. So maybe actually the MPFC 
is involved in something like people overall. What it cares about is people, be it people's bodily appearances, their physical appearances, their sensations, their, their thoughts, and so on and so forth, whereas these other areas seem to be playing a bigger role in other people's minds. So the reason that a lot of people, I mentioned early on that some of you all might have heard of stuff like this in, for example, developmental psychology and Professor Palmquist's course is because the development of theory of mind has really been a really interesting topic in neuroscience and psychology because there's a lot of developmental milestones at which children can and cannot exhibit um, evidence of having theory of mind. It turns out that a lot of younger kids don't seem like they have the capacity to form a theory of mind in the way that older kids do. And this happens at really reliable kind of moments in their developmental trajectory. So here, let's watch a couple of videos to get a sense of what, this is, what I mean by that. So here is a situation where this experimenter here is interacting with a five-year-old boy, and in a second we'll see it with a younger boy. This is the first pirate. His name is Ivan. And you know what pirates really like? What? Pirates really like cheese sandwiches. Cheese? I love cheese. Yeah. So Ivan has his cheese sandwich and he says, yum, 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 yum. I really love cheese sandwiches. And Ivan puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, you know what? I need a drink with my lunch. And so Ivan goes to get a drink. And while Ivan is away, the wind comes. And it blows the sandwich down onto the grass. And now, here comes the other pirate. This pirate is called Joshua. See? And Joshua also really loves cheese sandwich. So Joshua has a cheese sandwich. And he says, yum, 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 yum. I love cheese sandwiches. And he puts his cheese sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. So that one is his. That one's Joshua's. Then, that's right. Be, and then his went on the ground. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now. So he won't know which one is his. Oh, so now mm. Joshua goes off to get a drink. <laughs> back and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. So which one do you think Ivan's going to take? I think he was going to take that one. Yeah, you think he's going to take that one? All right, let's see. I told you. Oh that. yeah, you were right. He took that one. Okay. okay. So, so that's what happens with a five-year-old. Now we're going to watch the same video um, where this experimenter is going to cut to the end, do pretty much the same thing, but let's cut to the end with what happens with a three-year-old now. So now a, a younger child all the way to the end, and here's the end. And Ivan says, I want my cheese sandwich. Which sandwich is he going to take? Do you think he's going to take that one? Let's see what happens. Let's see what he does. Here comes Ivan, and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. And he takes this one. Uh-oh. Why'd he take that one? His was on the grass. Uh-huh. OK, so that's what a three-year-old looks like failing the false belief task. So things to notice, he's not uncertain or confused, right? He was really confident and ready to tell me what was going to happen. And when he um, saw that his prediction was wrong, right, Ivan took Joshua's sandwich instead of taking his own, the explanation he comes up with is for a reason why maybe Ivan wouldn't want his cheese sandwich anymore, right? His has fallen on the grass. Okay, so we can see that there's this difference here where the five-year-old is able to pass this false belief task and have an understanding of what Ivan does think that's independent of what the child thinks, whereas a three-year-old can't, okay? Turns out that that doesn't mean, though, that a five-year-old has fully formed theory of mind because then there's other dimensions of social cognition and theory of mind about moral permissibility and ethics and so on and so forth that actually a five-year-old can't do, but that's something like, let's say, a seven-year-old, an older kid can do. So here's some more videos using the same paradigm from the same researcher. Was Ivan being mean and naughty for taking Joshua's sandwich? Uh, yeah. Yeah? And so it's not until age seven that we get what looks more like an adult response. Should Ivan get in trouble for taking Joshua's sandwich? No, because the wind should get in trouble. Uh. He says the wind should get in trouble for switching. So the wind should get in trouble because the seven-year-old understands it was nobody's fault, it was a natural accident, whereas the five-year-old doesn't seem like he gets that yet. He thinks that uh, Eidman is doing something wrong. So that's just showing you what is going on in these situations behaviorally. But what you can do is you can then actually notice that there are these differences in the underlying um, brain regions that we were just talking about a second ago in children as you see these differences in theory of mind capabilities. So for example, in one study, they would uh, put children and adults in the scanner and they would have them read these different types of stories. So here's a case of a mental story. 
One day, a pirate told Jimmy about a hidden treasure. The pirate thought the treasure was buried behind Jimmy's house. Jimmy believed him. So Jimmy dug a big hole behind his house, and he didn't find a treasure. Jimmy soon realized that the pirate didn't know where the treasure was. I just realized I was reading it to you all like you were five years old because I think I was influenced by that woman. I don't know, really know why I did that. Okay, so that's a mental story where you're getting an explicit story about the mental state of Jimmy, what he thought, what he believed, what, the, what Jimmy thought the pirate thought. There's a lot of thinking about thinking about thinking. Um, here's another story that involves people, but it's more of a social story. It's just telling a narrative about what happened, not as much emphasis on thinking. Um, once there lived a musician, she was so good at playing the flute that when she played, everyone immediately started dancing. They couldn't stop dancing until she stopped playing. One night, a burglar came to rob the musician's house. She was practicing her flute, so the burglar started to dance. Yeah, you can kind of infer what the burglar is thinking about how much he must really like the flute music, but it's not nearly as focused on the mental states as this one up here. Uh, and then this last story is what's just like a, a physical story. So two houses stood side by side in a village. One house was made of wood and the other was made of brick. The wooden house was very tall and thin. The brick house was short and fat. One night, a big storm came to the village and in the morning, only the brick house was still standing, okay? So we have these three types of stories, the mental, the physical, the mental, the social, and the physical. Um, and what we're gonna do is I can first by just by show you what's going on in one of these regions. We could look at multiple ones, but for right now, let's just focus on this region here, the RTPJ. So what is going on, do you think, in the RTPJ of adults? Um, what you find is a pattern of activity like this, where the mental stories will activate RTPJ the most, then social, then physical, okay? Um, but the social and the physical are pretty darn close to one another, where it really seems like it's focusing and selecting on the stories and the situations where there's a lot of emphasis on what people are thinking about specifically. However, in younger children, in five to eight-year-olds and eight to 12-year-olds, you can see that the RTPJ is just not nearly as selective, okay? You can see that in five to eight-year-olds, the RTPJ is actually not yet figured out like, oh, okay, my interest and my focus is on mental stories, not social stories. And then the eight to 12-year-olds, you can see it's starting to get just a little bit selective. And then by the time you get to adults, you can see that it's still, that now it's the most selective, okay? So you can actually see a change in development that really change, um, the change in the neuro development rather, that really matches up with the behavioral development. And what you can actually do is even more fine grain analyses where you can look at how selective is the RTPJ, so how much higher is the red line than the other line, um, as a function of age. And you can see that as you get older and older, the uh, RTPJ gets more selective. And that this also is correlated with how well children do on false belief tasks, is understanding, you know, which, what is Ivan going to do? Is he gonna take this sandwich or that sandwich or, you know, some other sandwich in between? Um, okay, so why don't we, we'll stop there. And then hopefully um, what I've done is at least given you three kind of concrete situations and to give you an understanding about the sorts of different ways in which neuroscientists study social cognition social behaviors and so on and so forth. And there is a whole lot more to this stuff, um, but there's not necessarily this sort of overarching grandiose theories like there are in terms of visual processing, memory, reconsolidation, navigation, and so on and so forth. So hopefully this has at least exposed you to the sorts of ways that people do this. And especially hopefully it's kind of exposed you to some of the difficulties of studying neuro social neuroscience. Because again, these are not things like how does your brain process color versus black and white images or how does your brain process music versus not music, which are pretty straightforward. In these cases, you're trying to deal with much more abstract, personal, um, very human types of things such as social influence, peer pressure, perception, biases, and so forth. And it just turns out that part of the reason this is such a young field is because people are still kind of working on figuring out the main junctures in the brain and the mind of, of social cognition and how to study it effectively. So when we come back, we'll have two more of these little units um, and we'll actually transition to talking about the emotional brain and how emotions are processed and what we can learn about emotions from what's going on in your cortex.